when the appellate section undertook a review of a case that had already been in a default status, have you ever heard of such a review in your time at DOJ? No, I have not. But that does not mean that it has not occurred before. But I had never heard of the appellate section reviewing any case that I had been involved in. The document that, or the analysis that came back from the appellate section is dated May 13th. Now, the default judgment, or default time for the filing of default judgment is May 15th. Did you see a copy of the appellate section analysis? Yes. Why were you told any reason why the trial team and the appellate section team, a total of six career attorneys, were overruled? Well, if you're talking about conversations that occurred between Ms. King and Mr. Rosenbaum and I, I respectfully refuse to answer that question because the department has asserted the deliberative process privilege. Were you told whether any individuals other than Ms. King and Mr. Rosenbaum, specifically political appointees, weighed in, consulted, made decisions about the case? I can answer that this way. I am familiar judicial watch lawsuit and the documents that have been provided within the last week. And I see that there were a number of people outside the division who those documents that have been publicly released by the department indicate were contacted, such as Mr. Hirsch and other people at the department level. And that is the first time that I have received any information that people outside the division played a role in the decision concerning the new Black Panther Party case. You mentioned the lawsuit by judicial watch. A index of documents was released, as you say, earlier this week. Let me ask you about one entry. And I understand that you were not part of the documents that were produced, but I'm asking about the information. Item number 50 in that log shows an email from Steve Rosenbaum to Sam Hirsch, and it's summarized as follows. DAG, D-A-A-G, I assume that's Mr. Rosenbaum, provides OASG in charge of CRT, and that would be Mr. Hirsch, with requested follow-up information and confirmation that additional actions would be conducted by criminal section chief per his request. Did you ever hear of the criminal section also being involved in the decision making in the Black Panther case? No. Before he testified before the commission, Mr. Perez, which was on May 4th of this year, Mr. Perez had a meeting with you and Mr. Adams and Mr. Popper. Is that correct? Those would be discussions. Well, I can I can affirm that there was a meeting. Yes. Your hesitancy, are you not going to tell us what occurred during that meeting? No. Because of the deliberative process privilege that has been asserted by the department. In a magazine article about the new Black Panther case, it was alleged that there was two days of yelling as arising out of the time that the case got continued. Can you tell us anything about that? Well, in terms of the I won't tell you what the discussions were. I will. I will tell you that I became so frustrated with the process is that I did use profanity. It wasn't the first time that I've ever used profanity, but it was not my customary way of speaking to my supervisors at the division level. And I used the BS word that Mr. Adams identified in his testimony. And so to that extent, that yelling went on. Aside from use of profanity or not, was that did that arise out of the fact that it appeared that Mr. Rosenbaum had not been reading the background material supplied by the trial team for his review? 
No, it, it arose because the accusation had been, was made against me and Mr. Popper that wasn't true. Can you tell us what that accusation was? Uh, no, I can't. At any time during the discussions about what to do with the case or how it should proceed, did anyone accuse you or any member of the trial team of vi violating Rule 11 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure? There were uh, accusations made. Um, uh, I, I, I think Mr. Perez has, has mentioned, and uh, I think in testimony before Congress, has mentioned a Rule 11 concern. And, and um, we're not talking about 11B here, the, the, the section of the Voting Rights Act that, that uh, prohibits uh, uh, intimidation, threats, coercion. But we're talking about, the, as, as you well know, Mr. Blackwood, the uh, Rule 11 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure that would subject plaintiffs who bring a lawsuit to um, um, uh, 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 awards of money against them because there was no basis in law or in fact for bringing uh, the lawsuit. And uh, I have always been uh, flabbergasted uh, that, that anyone would make such a claim regarding the new Black Panther case. Um, uh, people can have differences uh, about a number of things, but we had eyewitness testimony, we had videotape that there were two people standing in uniform in front of a polling place in violation of, of the, the distance required by, by Pennsylvania law, as I recall, recall, for people to be away from the polling place. One of them had a weapon. They were hurling racial slurs, including to, uh, uh, to white voters, uh, uh, how do you think you're going to feel with a black man ruling over you uh, at the voters? They were standing in close proximity to each other to block the uh, ingress uh, into the polling place. Uh, the, the 11B of the Voting Rights Act uh, 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 prohibits attempts to intimidate or coerce uh, or threaten. It doesn't even require that the actual intimidation or coercion or threat occurred. It, it, it requires that no number of people be intimidated, but just the, uh, that there was an attempt at intimidation. And I've never been able to understand how anyone could accuse us of not having a basis in law and fact for bringing a straightforward 11B claim in circumstances where the evidence was so compelling. In the three memos that you have before you, A, B, and C, um, uh, specifically the uh, original J memo, then there's uh, the remedial memo, which uh, is addressing evidently uh, demands by K uh, Ms. King and Mr. Rosenbaum for additional information, and finally the appellate section review. There's absolutely no distinction between liability between Mr. Jackson and King Samir Shabazz. When did that first arise, or that issue? Were you ever asked to analyze it? I don't, um, um, I don't remember um, um, any public discussions um, uh, prior to the law, to, to, prior to the dismissal of the three defendants and the limitations on injunctive relief. I don't remember any public discussions of. Uh, of, um, of, of distinguishing between Mr. Jackson and Mr. Shabazz. And I'm not going to answer the question uh, about whether or not we had internal deliberative process uh, discussions about that. Okay. But as far as um, the remedial memo, the purpose of the remedial memo was to address what existing concerns of King and Rosenbaum, correct? Well, you, know, you, um, you can draw that inference, and I can see how you would logically draw that inference, but I'm not going to be able to confirm that. Um, in looking at the record, there is a reference, and also at the log provided by the uh, Judicial Watch litigation, it appeared that there was a, an extensive substantive memo, either April 29th or May 1st, or around that time, addressing concerns by Mr. Rosenbaum. Are you aware of that? I mean, can you confirm that? Uh, evidently by the trial team. It shows a, an email by you to Mr. Rosenbaum. Okay. Uh, well, if, uh, if there's a document to that effect, then uh, um, 
he would be logical in, 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 in reaching the, the conclusion that you speak of. Well, when Mr. Adams was here, he testified about the trial team at one point having to pull an all-nighter to address concerns by Mr. Rosenbaum. Mm -hmm. Does that sound accurate? Uh, I remember one night when uh, I didn't stay up all night, but I remember that uh, uh, Mr. Popper and I think Mr. Adams did in terms of, uh, uh, of, of completing their memorandum. They, when I came in the next morning, they looked sleepy, and, uh, and they told me that they had been there a goodly portion of the night. So that's, that's what I, information that I have in that regard. Just, just a final question. I'm sorry. It's a, it's, a, excuse me. it's a point of order, and it's for the uh, benefit of the witness, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Mr. Legal Counsel. I was a little uncomfortable about that, the last exchange about the email. Uh, on two reasons. One, it's very clear that uh, Mr. Coates wants to wants to steer very clear on the side of the deliberate process privilege. And if you're making rep representations to him about what an email may or may not say, I think be, I think he'd be more comfortable sh sh having the document in hand to know whether or not it actually was an e an, a a Vaughn index log of an email or the actual email itself, because I was unclear as exactly what it was, and I think that in terms of, in terms for the benefit of the uh, of the of the witness uh, in, to ensure that in, to ensure his compliance with uh, uh, his desire to be on the on the side of the deliberate process privilege, it would probably be uh, in our interest for him to make sure that he sees a document before he testifies about it, so he doesn't make any assumptions about the contents. So the record is clear: the document was not in front of you. Uh, I was talking about or reading off of an index that was provided as part of the Judicial Watch litigation against the uh, Department. And for the record, the Commission has also asked for such an index, as well as the underlying documents, and we have yet to receive them. But a final question, if I could, in my time. Uh, uh, before you go on, Mr. Coates, if there's any question that you feel uncomfortable with, um, please um, raise your hand. Let us know if we are bringing you into an area where you feel uncomfortable. Uh, we appreciate the fact that you have put yourself at risk by coming here to testify. Um, I have no desire to bring you to an area that's going to um, increase um, uh, the risk to you. Thank you, sir. You gave um, a going away speech on or about uh, January uh, 12th of this year. I'm sorry, it was earlier in January. I think it was January the 5th. Right. And you made a long statement. It's reported before members of the Civil Rights Division in the voting section. Is that right? Uh, just uh, Ms. Fernandez was there and Mr. Uh, Perez was there um, for part of the meeting. He had to leave prior to, to my remarks. There were, there were a couple uh, people uh, from outside the section there. Most of the people there were from the voting section. Some family members were there and people from other, a couple people from other sections in the division. Do you have a, cop, a written copy of what was said that day? Uh, no. Have you ever seen a version of what you allegedly said that day on National Review Online? Uh, there's a version of purportedly what you said that day. Have you ever seen that? Uh, I remember that uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Hans von Spakowski published an article that said that, that it was not a verbatim statement, but it was based upon views that he had had with uh, people who were present. Did you ever, ever have a chance to read it? I did. And what did it, although not a verbatim uh, transcript, it is accurately reflects what you said that it day? Was, it was an um, uh, uh, accurate reflection of the points that I made in my going away speech. Okay. Finally, uh, you transferred to uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office in South Carolina, is that correct? Yes, I'm presently employed as Assistant U.S. Attorney for the District of South Carolina. I'm on detail there from the Civil Rights Division, and the detail is for 18 months. Did you decide, was the decision to transfer voluntary? Well, it's, um, uh, let me explain it this way, and I don't mean to, it's not a, it's not a question that I think can be uh, accurately answered by yes or no. Uh, during the year of 2009, I had considerable uh, conflict with uh, um, uh, Ms. King and Mr. Rosenbaum, um, I, I, uh, and then I saw that Ms. Fernandez, as I've described, uh, management style was going to be 
in some ways similar to theirs. Uh, my relationship with her was a little better than with Ms. King and Mr. Rosenbaum. Julie and I have been knowing each other for a long time, and, and, and so uh, uh, I got along better with her. Uh, but my power is to run the section, to assign cases, to assign deputies, uh, was being uh, substantially reduced to where I believe that by the late fall of 2009 that I was uh, serving as chief only in name and that, it, that the decisions were being made by other uh, uh, management people in the section and at the division level. And of course, as a manager who has response, who, who is blamed when things go wrong, you don't want to be in a situation where uh, you're supposed to be running a section when in fact you're not. And so that, I took that into consideration. I took into consideration I knew that a number, number of people in the section um, uh, did uh, uh, in the division, I mean, the managers in the division, some of them did not want me as, uh, as the chief, including Ms. King, quite frankly, Mr. Rosenbaum, uh, quite frankly, and there were um, uh, a number of the, the people in the civil rights groups who did not want me as chief of the voting section. And some of those groups, as I've described, have significant uh, influence, I believe, in the Obama administration. So I just thought that it was a situation where uh, I was not going to be able to manage the section, and if you're not going to be able to do that, then why uh, pursue a course of action uh, that you have really no chance of winning? I have family in Charleston, South Carolina. I, my uh, uh, daughter and son-in-law, two grandchildren live there, and so I talked with uh, 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 Mr. Perez about working out a, a situation where I would voluntarily leave the chief of the position as chief of the voting section and transfer down to South Carolina for a period of time on detail, and that's what we were able to accomplish. If circumstances had been differently, I guess one of the ways I could describe that, if Senator McCain had won the election and, and, and the, uh, he had left me in and his people had left me in as chief of the voting section and there had been good relations between us, then I would have stayed on as chief of the voting section for a while longer. I am just the most important job I've ever had, and so therefore you don't give something up like that easily. But under the circumstances, I, I ask for the transfer, but I ask it in the circumstances that I have described. One final question. Who was the party, who was responsible for taking away your authority? Um, well, or diminishing your authority. Okay. Ms. King was involved in that, Mr. Rosenbaum had. Uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Fernandez uh, was involved in that. Uh, the, the, the type of limitations they put on my ability to make decisions in the management of the voting section, I believe, were not the kind of limitations that were placed on other chiefs uh, in the Civil Rights Division. I'm not saying I'm not, I'm, I'm not the only person who had those kind of limitations because I'm not the only chief who uh, has had conflicts with the division management. But it was unusual in comparison with how uh, other chiefs that, that they liked better were treated. Okay. Thank you. At this point, I will yield my time to Commissioner Gaziano. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you very much, uh, Mr. Coates. Uh, I think this is a morally right 